Hello, and welcome to Confronting Injustice. I am your host, Linda Solomon, and I'm joined by our co-host, James Watson, as we discuss the injustices of the criminal legal system. Our guest today is Andrea C. James. Andrea is the founder and executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Welcome to Confronting Injustice. Thank you. And I feel a little, um, the title should be so much more because I know you wear many hats, you do many things. Sure. Um, but can we start by you just telling us a bit about who you are and how you got into this, um, we'll call it abolitionist work or um, social justice work? Well, thank you for inviting me here. It's an honor to be here to um, have a platform to talk about this very important issue. I was really born into this work. I come from uh, an African-American family where I've been in Roxbury for five generations in the same home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my grandmother broke the color barrier for nursing at Boston City Hospital, which now has another name. Yes. You know, I have an uncle who was the first tenured law professor at UCLA, an aunt who was the first black pediatrician in L.A. County. So, you know, my parents were both researchers uh, scholars and ad, uh, researchers of people of African diaspora. And so we were raised up in, you know, around the time of the civil rights movement and really to have a deep knowledge and understanding of what it will take to bring racial equity um, in this country. And so that was my beginnings. <laughs> Um, and then I grew up to become, the only thing I ever wanted to do was a criminal defense attorney. And I did do that. I went to the best law school on the planet, Northeastern University School of Law. I was under the tutelage of a black dean at the time, David Hall, who was an incredible, incredible uh, mentor and teacher to us and challenged us along our journey through law school to, you know, not just settle for things because they are actually legal or they're of the law, but to question whether those things are moral. Um, are these things that need to be changed? Um, and so we had a really good foundation there. And then I was with the Public Defender Agency with a project called the Youth Advocacy Project Now Division, um, which teaches lawyers how to advocate on behalf of children. Um, that work with uh, the Youth Advocacy Project led to uh, them going on to create the education law project because a high percentage of young people in the Commonwealth and around the country show glaring signs of their, their onboarding into the criminal law system mm -hmm. through uh, their experience with education. It's really not rocket science what we're dealing with here. School to prison pipeline. School to prison pipeline. And okay. when those things are unaddressed, when the trauma uh, that children experience uh, go unaddressed or inappropriately uh, um, uh, uh, you know, attended to, you know, then that can lead children in another direction. Um, and so um, I practiced criminal defense law here in the Commonwealth and um, thought that was really the path that I was to take. There's very few people that have had the alchemy of life experiences that I've had from growing up in the most incarcerated corridor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is Nubian Square up to the Franklin Hill, Franklin Field housing development, and then becoming a criminal defense attorney, um, and then having the experience of becoming an incarcerated woman. As an attorney, I went to prison. Um, I was older, I was 45 years old. I made a mistake in my law practice, not in my criminal defense practice, which was my everything, yeah. but I, I, I was wooed into the real estate conveyance practice and it was at the height of predatory lending and made some mistakes there and was afraid to tell anybody. I was embarrassed. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have the emotional intelligence that I've you know, learned over the years and I tried to fix it myself and only made the matter worse. And that landed me in a federal prison. I didn't, nobody found out, I self-reported. I woke up one day and I looked at my husband who just couldn't understand what was going on with me. And you know, what is wrong with you? You are really acting very bizarre. I was just so stressed out and so worried about not being able to repair what I had done financially. And um, I said, I gotta self-report. And I did. 
and I went to the U.S. Attorney and I went to the DA and uh, lawyered up and told them I've made mistakes and I've done some financial malfeasance and I need to correct this. Mm -hmm. And I did. And it took two years for them to figure out what to do with me. Um, but I eventually uh, was sentenced to serve a two-year federal prison sentence. Um, and I served that time in a women's federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut, as there's no uh, women's federal prisons here in the Commonwealth. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Incredible. What's, what stands out for me at this moment is the fact that you just had a baby when you were sent to prison. I did. I had two young adult daughters who were both either one starting college, one coming out of college. I had a 12-year-old daughter at the time who's now a graduate of Spelman nice. and back here doing this movement work. Wonderful. And I did. I had um, a baby um, just before um, my incarceration. And he's now 14 years old and thriving, thank goodness. You know, I had a husband. I was very, very lucky. I had two parents who committed themselves um, to, you know, making sure that my children were well taken care of, that they didn't um, suffer any further trauma because of my absence. And I had a, a husband who was just incredible, who drove my, my baby girl and my little, my 12-year-old daughter and my baby boy um, to see me. Um, every single visit, never missed a visit. Even when I pleaded with him in the winter when there were blizzards to please not get on the highway, he showed up and okay. kept okay. my two youngest children as connected to me as possible. That's absolutely incredible. That's strength. Yeah. That's some serious yeah. And yeah. love. And love. Well, he knew. My husband was formerly incarcerated as well many, many, many years ago. Okay. He grew up on the streets of New York City in a very different um, the environment and, and family structure than the privileged one that I had. Mm -hmm. And very early, he was brought into the drug game at the height of the drug war. Mm -hmm. And he suffered significantly and sentenced, started his first sentence at age 16. Mm -hmm. And he would often say to me, you know, babe, I can't understand it. We were boys. You know, we didn't have any direction and any mentors, but the only response that they had for us was to put us in prison at the age of 16 and immediately started to uh, experience further trauma by the incarceration of being a 16-year-old boy on Rikers Island. And that, of course, led to some state time and then a final mandatory minimum federal sentence. So he understood and he had grown significantly and really worked on himself inside of himself to come out to be the man that he was able to grow into and just was the salt of the earth, the most incredible husband. And we lost him um, unexpectedly to a heart attack. And that's something that my kids talk about all the time. My children say, you know, we can't get that time back with dad. He never should have been sentenced to, that should never have been the response for most of his life. Um, it, it, we, we have better solutions. We absolutely do. And although we're not talking about adverse childhood experiences, what I hear you say, and we, probably, we should do a show about that because to no fault of your husbands and many people who are in jail, they have experiences as children that result in them being where they are. Well, we, we actually wrote a bill about that. Um, it's called the Primary Caretaker Bill. We passed it here in Massachusetts. Uh, we've passed it in seven other states around the country, and it's being worked on now in 15 states, 15 states currently. And we wrote the Primary Caretaker Bill because, you know, we do unapologetically focus on women and girls, but women and girls have husbands, sons, brothers, so all of our work affects everybody. But the majority of women who are incarcerated, who are mothers, were the primary caretakers of their children prior to their incarceration. And so when you talk about an adverse childhood experience, you are really talking about the trauma from when a mother is taken from her children too often right in front of her children. The last time her children have laid eyes on their mother or been able to spend time and hold their mother uh, was, you know, at that moment when some law enforcement agency was removing them and the mother 
often, I was in federal prison. And so women were from all around the country in that prison with me. And some of them had not seen their children since they were looking out the back window of a police vehicle. And that was seven, eight, 10 mm -hmm. years ago. Incredible trauma, incredible trauma. Yeah, the, chi the child welfare system, what we call the family policing system, is another pipeline to incarceration. Huge, huge percentages of men and women Absolutely. who are incarcerated were foster children. Absolutely. And it's, it's something that we have to understand. It's another system mm -hmm. that needs to be, there's this incredible advocate, Joyce McMillan in New York, who talks about this, who was incarcerated and fought to keep mm -hmm. custody of her children, which is almost impossible to do. And so um, there's an entire movement of women, formerly incarcerated women, who are helping women inside to keep their children, but also the Clinton era ushered in the Adoption Safe Family Act. And that's a policy that has been devastating, particularly to black mothers. This has disparately impacted black women and um, the removal of children during a woman's incarceration because what the Adoption Safe Family Act requires, which was part of that whole 1994 Crime Bill Act, was that if you're absent from your child's life for 15 out of 24 months, the state must, shall, uh, begin adoption proceedings. And that left no loophole for women who are incarcerated. And nobody thought about women who are incarcerated, who were great mothers. We have, we're always painted with this brush of, Broad if you're of in prison, you were a bad mother. And that's the furthest from the truth. Many, many, many women are incarcerated because they were desperate to take care of their children. And they made choices out of no choices at all. Fathers too. Fathers, fathers too, absolutely. Incredible. I was not familiar with that. That is just so inhumane. I just cannot even, I can't even, it's beyond my comprehension how you can, you know, you go to prison because of something you do. And in many cases, it may be something you didn't do because there are a lot of people who were in jail for things they did not do. A lot. Um, and then to have the children taken away and no recourse. And children love their mothers. They love their parents. They love their fathers. Yeah. And they want things to be um, healthy. They want to be able to thrive with their family. And so when you're talking about um, people who are struggling with the illness of addiction, it's an illness. Absolutely. And we address it with criminality. And that's a real problem. And we um, treat people as if they're undeserving mm -hmm. of, of being able to get healing. And sometimes we have to really push ourselves to understand that that may not involve somebody being able to stop using. And this is the reality of what the illness of addiction. I don't talk much about it because it's not my personal experience, but we've learned from experts like Stacey Borden at New Beginnings Reentry. We've learned from sisters who have gone through the experience, who help us to understand that Sometimes we have to have different degrees of addressing the issue, particularly Absolutely. the illness of addiction. Absolutely. And in my work, I've been able to travel the world and I've seen other countries that have done other things to address the illness of addiction, including safe injection sites, finding places where people um, medicated assistant treatment, mm -hmm. things that this country and even the Commonwealth just is not effectively addressing the need of all people, everybody, whatever degree of, of, of issue or struggle that you're going through, we're human beings, we're not animals, and we all deserve to have a level of humanity in how we're treated. Absolutely. I, there's no doubt about it. We could talk about, listen, all of that is really important and, I'm, <clears throat> and it's wonderful that the audience gets to hear it. I want to talk about the National Council, the work, the incredible work that you're doing. So can you tell us about the, the National Council and your role and what yeah. you're doing and what people can do if they want to help? Yes. And so I don't want to cut all the yeah, No, that's okay. No, this is interesting. We might have a part two on this one. <laughs> well, the National Council grew out of the work we actually started to do while incarcerated women inside of the federal prison mm -hmm. in Danbury, Connecticut. And that work led to the creation of Families for Justice as Healing, mm -hmm. which is the uh, organization that we have here 
in Massachusetts. National Council is located here in Roxbury as well, in our building on 100 Warren Street, mm -hmm. right in Nubian Square. But our origins were starting as women in prison to organize ourselves and to throw the gauntlet down to say, we're gonna end incarceration of women and girls. We had no idea how we were gonna do it. <laughs> and so, but we did. In 2010, it was a pivotal year in the country. Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, Absolutely. was published in 2010. We read that book in prison. And also another of our comrades who we didn't know at the time, but wrote another significant book because of who it, who it helped to change their, their, their thinking about incarceration of women. And that's Piper Kerman. Piper Kerman wrote Orange is the New Black. Um, she's a dear friend now and a comrade of ours. We've been to the White House uh, together and continue to advocate for things together. But Piper's book really changed the mindset of particularly young white college age women who really became, um, and older white women as well, who really kind of paid attention and started to pour in to figure out how do we help? What are the things that we can bring into the struggle to really reshape criminal law and, and, and usher in the concept of abolition? And so those were our origins. The National Council now, we are um, about to do a national uh, March in Washington, D.C., 10 years ago. We've been around since 2010 in the prison. But 10 years ago, we marched on Washington. We were introduced to President Obama and to Valerie Jarrett. Nice. We were invited to the White House several times and working with civil rights lawyer and, and Kichi Taifa. And we were able to, along with a, another woman who received clemency, Amy Pova, under President Clinton, we were able through President Obama to push more than 50 women out of the federal system who were serving very long, draconian, many of them double and triple life plus, mm. plus 20 year sentences like our director of clemency, Danielle Metz. It just, Danny was a girlfriend of a drug dealer in New Orleans. He was sentenced, he's still in prison. We're fighting to get Glenn Metz home. But Danielle Metz served 23 years before we were able to get her out under the height of the drug war, U.S. attorneys were sentencing particularly black women mm -hmm. to triple life sentences plus years. So Danny received a triple life sentence plus 20 years. And by the grace of God and President Obama, um, she was released through clemency and she is now our director of clemency. Folks can go to our website and watch Danny's video. Mm -hmm. We're fighting for another woman, several women, but, but Michelle West, Lazar Daz, those are other black women who, that, who at the height of the drug war received those same sentences. It took seven years before any white person who, there's no difference between uh, black and white other than black people are not the majority, have never been the majority, drug users of any type, from heroin to fentanyl to crack cocaine, which we were criminalized for, which we're seeing a very dramatic yes. difference now at the height of the opioid crisis. Back then it was about criminalizing black people. But even back then we weren't the majority users of crack cocaine in this country. And so what people don't understand is it took seven years before a white person was indicted and prosecuted for crack cocaine. In the meanwhile, for over a 10 year period, we were building a prison in this country every 10 days. And we were filling those prisons with drug war casualties. And those were black people. And so we have to really take into consideration what we've done in this country. And that's why, be, ushered in by the 1994 Crime Act, which our current president, who was the vice president under President Obama, who worked so closely with us, mm -hmm. President Biden now, we're urging him. It was black women, black people in our communities who stood and told that line that helped to get him into office. And he's got a real big fight ahead of him right now. Oh, yes, um, and does. we're fighting now not just for him to get into office, but for democracy in general. But we have to encourage him that he has to pick up that pen. The fastest way for racial equity inside of the criminal law system is clemency. You have people who are still casualties of the drug war, who are still buried in prisons, who are serving life with no parole sentences in the federal system. And you have people who have been dramatically affected by the drug war in the state systems across this country, including here in the Commonwealth. So we're coming back. 
um, 10 years later, um, where, um, uh, rally, uh, where rally, marching from the historic Metropolitan AME Church in Washington, D.C. to Freedom Plaza um, and rallying there to encourage not only President Biden to pick up your pen. We have a list of 100 women who are sick, who are elderly, who have spent decades in the federal prison system. Many of them are dying. How much is enough? When is enough enough? And these are simply on, mar on marijuana charges. Many of them are on marijuana charges. Legalized. We still have people who are serving marijuana sentences. We just left a, a, the largest marijuana cannabis conference in the country, and we went there on purpose. We went there to speak and to raise awareness as we have a burgeoning cannabis industry now, we still have people who are buried inside of state prisons and people who are in federal prisons with cannabis related uh, convictions mm -hmm. who are serving um, sentences. And so w it's another uh, industry that we're locked out of with people with felony convictions. Um, you know, there's lots of new industries, the digital transportation industry like Uber and Lyft that people with felony convictions who are salt of the earth people now, who committed transgressions many, many, many years ago, mm -hmm. who are just trying to live a dignified life, who are carved out of these industries that, you know, we have a former sheriff who owns licenses, we have mm -hmm. former prosecutors who were first in line to get the cannabis licenses, a license that somebody like myself could not get mm -hmm. because of my uh, transgression and felony conviction. So these are things that need to change. But the National Council does the work unapologetically. We do focus on women and girls, but because women are the pillars of our communities, it affects everybody. Let me, let me say that um, there's a few things. There were people who mass murder people who don't get triple life, don't get double life. I think that this, it might be difficult for people to, to really hear you when you say, hey, that there were people who, um, for drug charges, have been convicted to sentences that are just so inhumane, it doesn't make sense. So I'm wondering about um, these judges and people who convict these women, no accountability? Like, well, we have, we have laws such as mandatory minimums that were ushered in again under the Clinton administration that have been around for decades now. Mandatory minimums also spread out through the states. When you have mandatory minimums, it takes away the judicial discretion. But we still have to understand that we have a criminal law system, as Michelle Alexander so brilliantly laid out chronologically for us, that is built on an on a, on a entrenched system of racism. And when we as a country um, don't address that, and particularly during the very turbulent times that we're going through right now, where we've just, you know, people in this country with big platforms have just inflamed and, and created more of a significant racial divide. We're even further away now than we were some years ago when we were beginning to think and push to, to, to right. rectify and to address, just to simply acknowledge. You know, now we're not even acknowledging. We have Governor Santos in Florida who's, right. you know, don't, won't allow black history to be taught in schools anymore. And, you know, it's really unfortunate. So we have to continue to do this work, and we do. And it's not so much, we don't differentiate. We're an abolitionist organization. And abolition to some people is just this crazy concept, like, oh, you just want all these people to know, yeah, we don't believe in prisons and jails because prisons and jails only cause further harm. Mm -hmm. And we must address that issue. The current state of incarceration in this country, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the prisons in this state are toxic, violent places. So it's not that in abolition we don't believe in accountability. Mm -hmm. We absolutely do. We believe in accountability more so than even what people are held to be held accountable for in the current criminal law system, in the current prison system. But the difference is that we base our things on healing. We base our things on trying to get to the root cause of what could cause a person to cause an egregious level of harm to where they would take another person's life. That's something that you and I aren't going to do. We're not going to get out of this stool and go take a person's life. So we have to figure out what is going on. What are the on-ramps 
And how far back do we have to go to really look at why somebody can do this? There's significant trauma involved going back throughout this person's lifetime. There's mental illness that we're not addressing. We're all equating it as criminality. There are all these factors that because we just want to rely on prisons. And we must be honest that prisons have been used as a tool of oppression and control. Always, historically. Can I just say, one of, for people who are interested in supporting, go, because I'm considering going myself to Washington, I think oh, that's please major. Come. If people want to get interested, want to become involved or go to Washington just to make a statement or to stand up and say, that they don't agree with the systemic is it injustice. Mm -hmm. What can they do? How can well, they we have buses leaving, buses, are, buses planes, trains. Uh, people are coming from around the country mm. um, to attend this rally. Many people from the Women's March are attending also. It's the day immediately following the Women's March, which is very okay. important. So there'll be thousands of people with us. And what who date are, is that? April 24th okay. um, in Washington, D.C. We have buses leaving from our office space over at the National Council on Families for Justice as Healing, okay. which is 100 Warren Street. Mm -hmm. They can go on to our website at Good. National Council, like a city council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L, okay. dot U-S, like us, National Council dot us, and they can register. And all of the information is there. And you can also see the breadth of information. We have a legal division. We have a policy division. Wonderful. We have a community organizing division. And we lead the national campaign to close women's prisons. Wonderful. We only have about a minute left. We didn't even have an opportunity to talk about your books, your letter to your children. There's so much that we didn't get to talk about. But um, Come back. Yeah, we'll yeah. have to have you back another back. time. Um, it's a big issue. <laughs> it is. It absolutely is. And it's worthy of all of our time and attention. Well, thank for you sure. for inviting me. Thank you very much. Um, and also let the women know, you know, they're wounded, but not broken. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, wounded, not broken. Mm -hmm. And we're here. Thank you. You know, they're not alone. So thank you for being um, with us this morning. And um, thank you to the audience for watching Confronting Injustice. We wish you all the, you know, it's not even luck. We just, we're with you. Thank you. We're with you. Yes. Got to come back. We got to finish this. We got to come back. It's too, it's too much. Just. <laughs>